Hello everyone, good evening, it's me again, Erin Dave, and tonight I will be discussing or reporting about the topic, Emotional and Personality Development. So for starters, Emotional Development and Personality Development means how children in middle and late adolescence start to understand who they are, what they are feeling, and what to expect when interacting with others. It is the development of being able to form and sustain positive relationships, experience, manage, and express emotions, and become able to have a sense of self. In this topic, we will discuss emotional and personality development in middle and late childhood with the subtopics, the self, moral development, emotional development, and gender. So let's start with the self. What is the nature of the child's self-understanding, understanding of others, and self-esteem during the elementary school years? What roles do self-efficacy and self-regulation play in children's achievement? The development of self-understanding. Self-understanding becomes more complex in middle and late childhood. From 8 to 11 years of age, children increasingly describe themselves in terms of psychological characteristics and traits, in contrast with the more concrete self-descriptions of younger children. For example, older children are more likely to describe themselves using adjectives such as popular, nice, helpful, mean, smart, and dumb. In addition, during the elementary school years, Children become more likely to recognize social aspects of the self. They include references to social groups in their self-descriptions, such as referring to themselves as a Girl Scout, a Catholic, or someone who has two close friends. Children's self-understanding in the elementary school years also includes increasing reference to social comparison. At this point in development, children are more likely to distinguish themselves from others in comparative rather than in absolute terms. That is, Elementary school age children are no longer likely to think about what they do or do not do, but are more likely to think about what they can do in comparison with others. Consider a series of studies in which Diane Rublé, 1983, investigated children's use of social comparison in their self-evaluations. In her study, children were given a difficult task and then offered feedback on their performance, as well as information about performances of other children their age. The children were then asked for self-evaluations. Children younger than seven made virtually no reference to the information about other children's performances. However, many children older than seven included socially comparative information in their self-descriptions. In sum, in middle and late childhood, self-description increasingly involves psychological and social characteristics, including social comparison. So in middle and late childhood, Self-understanding expands to reflect other people's perceptions. A key feature of this period is an increasing sensitivity to the needs and expectations of others and to the knowledge of the self that comes from them. So let's move on to understanding others. In middle and late childhood, perspective taking, the social cognitive process involved in assuming the perspective of others and understanding their thoughts and feelings improves. Executive function is at work in perspective taking. Among the executive functions called on when, they, when children engage in perspective taking are cognitive inhibition and cognitive flexibility. So when we say cognitive inhibition, it means controlling one's own thoughts to consider the perspective of others, while cognitive flexibility means seeing situation in different ways. So, in middle and late childhood, we begin to consider points of views from other people, whether we are just being considerate on what they think about a subject, or we want them to confirm or either disagree with your own point of view. We become skeptical and make sure we make right decisions. For better understanding, perspective taking is the ability to look beyond your own point of view so that you can consider how someone else may think or feel about something. To do this successfully, you must have some understanding of others' thoughts, feelings, motivations, and intention. Perspective taking is thought to be especially important in determining whether children develop prosocial or antisocial attitudes and behavior. In terms of prosocial behavior, taking another's perspective improves children's likelihood of understanding and sympathizing with others when they are distressed or in need. In middle and late childhood, children also become more skeptical of others' claims. So prosocial behavior is basically voluntary behavior intended to benefit others. As it states in this slide, the action of being prosocial are motivated, motivated by empathy and selflessness, or without intention on gaining something back. Prosocial behavior fosters positive traits that are that are beneficial for children and society. 
So self-esteem and self-concept. High self-esteem and positive self-concept are important characteristics of children's well-being. Self-esteem refers to global evaluations of the self. It is called self-worth or self-image. For example, a child may perceive that she is not merely a person, but a good person. While self-concept refers to domain-specific evaluations of the self. Children can make self-evaluations in many domains of their lives, academic, athletic, appearances, and so on. In sum, self-esteem refers to global self-evaluations, self-concept to domain-specific evaluations. The foundation of self-esteem and self-concept emerge from the quality of parent-child interaction in infancy and early childhood. So in comparison, self-concept is how we think of ourselves, the mental image we have of who we are and why that is, and what are we doing in the world. While self-esteem is much fluffier concept, so it means to hold oneself in high record, presumably in balanced way that reflects one's worth. However, one cannot build the self-concept on basis of having self-esteem. Those who try to do so only end up with narcissistic defenses. Thus, if children have low self-esteem in middle and late childhood, they may have experienced neglect or abuse in relationship with their parents earlier in development. Children with high self-esteem are more likely to be securely attached to parents and have parents who engage in sensitive caregiving. Self-efficacy The belief that one can master a situation and produce favorable outcomes is called self-efficacy. Albert Bandura states that self-efficacy is a critical factor in whether or not students achieve. Self-efficacy is the belief that I can. Helplessness is the belief that I cannot. Students with high self-efficacy endorse such statements as, quote, I know that I will be able to learn this material in this class. And, quote, I expect to be able to do well in this activity. Dale Shunk has able to apply this concept of self-efficacy to many aspects of children's achievement. In his view, self-efficacy influences a student's choice of activities. Students with low self-efficacy for learning may avoid many learning tasks, especially those that are challenging. By contrast, their counterparts with high self-efficacy eagerly work at learning tasks. Students with high self-efficacy are more likely to expand effort and persist longer at the learning task than students with low self-efficacy. So self-efficacy is basically the belief we have in our own abilities, especially our ability to meet the challenges ahead of us and complete a task successfully. So in addition, one of the reasons why there are some children that are low in self-efficacy is by having bad negative criticisms, whether by parenting or in school context. They lost their sense of self. They just basically lost hope and positivity with everything that they're doing in their life. Self-regulation. One of the most important aspects of self in middle and late childhood is an increased capacity for self-regulation. This increased capacity is characterized by deliberate efforts to manage one's behavior, emotions, and thoughts, leading to increased social competence and achievements. In one study, higher levels of self-control assessed at four years of age were linked to Improvements in the math and reading achievements of early elementary school children living in a predominantly rural and low-income context. Another study found that self-control increased from 4 years to 10 years of age, and that high self-control was linked to lower levels of deviant behavior. In this study, parenting characterized by warmth and positive effect predicted the development increase in self-control. The increased capacity for self-regulation is linked to developmental advances in the brain's prefrontal cortex. While the increased focal activation in the prefrontal cortex that is linked to improved cognitive control, which includes self-regulation. Self-regulation allows kids to manage their emotions, behavior, and body movement when faced with tough situations. Self-regulation isn't the same as self-control. Kids with ADHD and sensory processing issues often struggle with self-regulation. So industry versus inferiority. Recall Eric Erikson's eight stages of the human development. His fourth stage is industry versus inferiority appears during middle and late childhood. The term industry expresses a dominant theme of this period. Children become interested in how things are made and how they work. When children are encouraged in their efforts to make, build, and work, whether building a model airplane, constructing a tree house, fixing a bicycle, solving an addition problem, or cooking, their sense of industry increases. However, parents who see their children's effort at making things as mischief or making a mess encourage children's development of a sense of inferiority. In addition, according to Eric Erickson, Children in middle and late childhood are very busy or industrious. They are constantly doing, planning, playing, getting together with friends, and achieving. This is a very active time and a time when they are gaining a sense of how they measure up when compared to peers. Erickson believed that if these industrious children can be successful in their endeavors, they will get a sense of confidence for future challenges. If not, 
His sense of inferiority can be particularly haunting during middle and late childhood. School becomes especially important in this regard. Consider children who are slightly below average in intelligence. They are too bright to be in special classes, but not too bright enough to be in gifted classes. They fail frequently in their academic efforts, developing a sense of inferiority. By contrast, consider children whose sense of industry is derogated at home. A series of sensitive and committed teacher may revitalize their sense of industry. So let's move on down to emotional development. Emotional development is about an individual's feeling for it and about other people, objects, situation, experience. Preschoolers become more adept at talking about their own and others' emotions. They also show a growing awareness of the need to control and manage their emotions to meet social standards. In middle and late childhood, children further develop their understanding and self-regulation of emotion. In a recent study, a low level of emotional regulation in childhood was especially important in predicting a higher level of externalizing problems in adolescence. So developmental changes. Developmental changes in emotion during the middle and late childhood years include following. Improved emotional understanding. For example, children in elementary school develop an increased ability to understand such complex emotions as pride and shame. Number two is increased understanding that more than one emotion can be expressed in a particular situation. For example, a third grader may realize that achieving something might involve both anxiety and joy. Increased tendency to be aware of the events leading to emotional reactions. A fourth grader may become aware that her sadness today is influenced by her friend moving to another town last week. The next one is ability to suppress and conceal negative emotional reactions. For example, a fifth grader has learned to tone down his anger better than he used to when one of his classmates irritates him. The use of self-initiated strategies for redirecting feelings, for example. In elementary school years, children become more reflective about their emotional lives and increasingly use strategies to control their emotions. They become more effective at cognitively managing their emotions, such as soothing themselves after an upset. The last one is the capacity for genuine empathy. For example, a fourth grader feels sympathy for a distressed person and experiences the sadness the distressed person is feeling. So in general, the developmental changes that is present or evolves in middle and late childhood involves the maturity of self in the aspect of identifying what's good and bad in every context and of course becoming emotional or having emotional reactions to certain things that relate to us. So social emotional education programs. An increasing number of social-emotional education programs have been developed to improve many aspects of children's and adolescents' lives. Two such programs are the Second Step Program and the Collaborative for Academic Social and Emotional Learning, or for short, CASEL. Many social-emotional education programs only target young children, but Second Step can be implemented in pre-K through 8th grade, and CASEL can be used with pre-K through 12th grade students. Let's start with Second Step. Second Step focuses on these aspects of social-emotional learning from pre-K through the 8th grade. Number one, pre-K, self-regulation and executive function skills that improve their attention and help them control their behavior. Number two, kindergarten to gr grade five, making friends, self-regulation of emotion, and solving problems. And grade six to eight, communication skills, coping with stress, and decision-making to avoid engaging in problem behaviors. So CASEL, or Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning, targets five core social and emotional learning domains. Number one is self-awareness. For example, recognizing one's emotion and how they affect behavior. The second one is self-management. For example, self-control, coping with stress, and impulse control. The third one is social awareness, or perspective taking and empathy. The fourth one is relationship skills, developing positive relationships and communicating effectively with individuals from diverse backgrounds. And the last one is responsible decision making, or engaging in ethical behavior and understanding the consequences of one's actions, for example. So coping with stress. An important aspect of children's emotional lives is learning how to cope with stress. As children get older, they're able to come accurately appraise a stressful situation and determine how much control they have over it. Older children generate more coping alternatives for stressful conditions and use more cognitive coping strategies. For example, younger children may be very disappointed that their teacher did not say hello to them when they arrived at school. Older children may reframe this type of situation and think she may have been busy with other things and just forget to say things or say hello. They are better than younger children at intentionally shifting their thoughts to something that is less stressful and at reframing or changing their perception of a stressful situation. Disasters can especially harm children's development and reduce adjustment problems. Among the outcomes of children who experience disasters are acute stress reactions, depression, panic disorder, and post-traumatic stress disorder. 
So the likelihood that a child will face these problems following a disaster depends on factors such as the nature and severity of the disaster and type of support available to the child. So late and middle childhood and early adolescence are filled with transitions that can cause psychological stress. Degrees of stress experienced are a function of both emotional response and coping abilities. Children who have developed a number of coping techniques have the best chance of adapting and functioning competently in the face of disasters and traumas. Researchers have offered the following recommendations for parents, teachers, and other adults caring for children after a disaster. The first one is reassure children of their safety and security. Number two, allow children to retell events and be patient in listening to them. Number three, encourage children to talk about any disturbing or confusing feelings, reassuring them that such feelings are normal after a stressful event. Protect children from re-exposure to frightening situations and reminders of the trauma, for example, by limiting discussion of the event in front of the children. And the last one is help children make sense of what happened, keeping in mind that children may misunderstand what took place, for example. Young children may blame themselves believe things happen that did not happen, believe that terrorists are in the school, etc. Gently help children develop a realistic understanding of the event. Traumatic events may cause individuals to think about moral aspects of life. Hopelessness and despair may short-circuit moral development when a child is confronted by the violence of war zones and impoverished inner cities. Let's further explore children's moral development. So let's move on to moral development. KJ proposed that young children are characterized by heteronymous morality, but by about 10 years of age, they have moved into a higher stage called autonomous morality. According to PJ, older children consider the intention of the individual, believe that rules are subject to change, and are aware that punishment does not always follow wrongdoing. So moral development describes the evolution of these guiding principles and is demonstrated by ability to apply these guidelines in the daily life. Teens must make moral judgment on a daily basis. When children are younger, their family, culture, and religion greatly influence their moral decision-making. So a second major perspective on moral development was proposed by Lawrence Kohlberg. Piaget's cognitive stages of development serves as the underpinnings for Kohlberg's theory, but Kohlberg suggested that there are three levels of moral development. These levels, he argued, are universal. Development from one level to another, said Kohlberg, is, is fostered by opportunities to take the perspective of others and to experience conflict between one's current level of moral thinking and the reasoning of someone at higher level. So the Kohlberg levels. Kohlberg described three levels of moral thinking. A key concept in understanding progression through the levels is that the person's morality gradually becomes more internal or mature. That is, the reasons for moral decisions or values begin to go beyond the external or superficial reasons they gave when they were younger. So Kohlberg levels. In Kohlberg level one, or should I say pre-conventional morality, at this level, children interpret good and bad in terms of external rewards and punishments. At this stage, Kohlberg says people see rules as fixed and absolute. Obeying the rules is important because it is a means to avoid punishment. Kohlberg's level 2, or conventional reasoning. It states here that individuals abide by certain standards, but they are the standards of others, such as parents or the laws of society. This stage is focused on maintaining a social order. At this stage of moral development, people begin to consider society as a whole when making judgments. The last one is Kohlberg's level 3, or post-conventional reasoning. At this level, morality is more internal. Individuals engage in deliberate checks on the reasoning to ensure that it meets high ethical standards. At this stage, people follow these internalized principles of justice, even if they conflict with laws and rules. Colbert maintained that these levels occur in sequence and are age-related. Before age 9, most children use level 1, pre-conventional reasoning based on external rewards and punishments, when they consider moral choices. By early adolescence, their moral reasoning is increasingly based on the application of standards that set by others, reflecting conventional reasoning. By early adulthood, a small number of individuals reason in post-conventional ways. So Kohlberg believed that individuals could only progress through these stages one stage at a time. That is, they could not jump stages. They could not, for example, move from an orientation of selfishness to the law and order stage without passing through the good boy or girl stage. They could only come to comprehension of a moral rationality one stage above their own. Thus, according to Kohlberg, it was important to present them with moral dilemmas for discussion, which would help them to see the reasonableness of a higher stage morality and encourage their development in that direction. So influences on the Kohlberg levels. Kohlberg argued that advances in children's cognitive development did not ensure development of moral reasoning. Instead, moral reasoning also reflects children's experiences in dealing with moral questions and moral conflict. Kohlberg emphasized that peer interaction and perspective taking 
are critical aspects of social stimulation that challenges children to change their moral reasoning, whereas adults characteristically impose rules and regulations on children. The give and take among peers gives children an opportunity to take the perspective of another person and to generate rules democratically. So let's move on to the domain theory, especially moral, social, conventional, and personal reasoning. In domain theory, children's and adolescents' moral, social, conventional, and personal knowledge and reasoning emerge from their attempts to understand and deal with different forms of social experience. Some theorists and researchers argue that Kohlberg did not adequately distinguish between moral reasoning and social conventional reasoning. Social conventional reasoning focuses on conventional rules that have been established by social consensus in order to control behavior and maintain the social system. The rules themselves are arbitrary, such as raising your hand in class before speaking, or using one staircase at school to go up and the other to go down, or not cutting in front of someone standing in line to buy movie tickets, and stopping at the stop sign when driving. There are sanctions if you violate these conventions, although they can be changed by consensus. In contrast, moral reasoning focuses on ethical issues and rules of morality, unlike conventional rules. Moral rules are not arbitrary. They are obligatory, widely accepted, and somewhat impersonal. The domain theory of moral development states that there are different domains of social knowledge and reasoning, including moral, social, conventional, and personal domains. Rules pertaining to lying, cheating, stealing, and physically harming another person are moral rules because violation of these rules affronts ethical standards that exist apart from social consensus and convention. Moral judgments involve concepts of justice, whereas social conventional judgments are concepts of social organization. Violating moral rules is usually more serious than violating conventional rules. Personal issues include control over one's body, privacy, and choice of friends and activities. Thus, some actions belong to a personal domain and are not governed by moral reasoning or social norms. So pro-social behavior. The study of pro-social behavior has placed more emphasis on the behavioral aspect of moral development. Children engage in immoral, antisocial acts such as lying and cheating and also display pro-social behavior such as showing empathy or acting altruistically. Even during preschool years, children may care for others or comfort others in distress. During their first years, when children share, it is usually not for reasons of empathy, but for the fun of the social play ritual or out of imitation. Then at about four years of age, a combination of empathic awareness and adult encouragement produces a sense of implications on the part of the child to share with others. Most four-year-olds are not self-sustained, however. Children believe they have an obligation to share, but do not necessarily think they should be as generous to others as they are to themselves. Children sharing comes to reflect a more complex sense of what is just and right during middle and late childhood. So, the development of pro-social behavior is complex as children have to balance their own needs and interests with the development of social bonds. In addition, pro-social behavior has been correlated with positive social interaction skills, positive self-concept, positive peer relationships, peer acceptance, as well as lower risk of externalizing behaviors and lower levels of problems behavior at school. Let's move on down to moral personality. Beyond the development of moral reasoning and specific moral feelings and pro-social behaviors, do children also develop a pattern of moral characteristic that is distinctively their own? In other words, do children develop a moral personality? And if so, what are its components? Researchers have focused attention on three possible components. Moral identity, moral character, and moral exemplars. Let's start with moral identity. Individuals have a moral identity when moral notions and moral commitments are central to their lives. They construct self with reference to moral categories. Next one is moral character. A person with moral character has the willpower, desire, and integrity to stand up to pressure, overcome distractions and disappointments, and behave morally. The last one is moral exemplars. Moral exemplars are people who live exemplary moral lives. Their moral personality, identity, character, and set of virtues reflect moral excellence and commitments. In sum, moral development is a multifaceted, complex concept. Included this complexity are an individual's thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and personality. So let's move on down to our last topic, I mean the last subtopic, the gender. So long before elementary schools, Boys and girls show preference for different poison activities. Preschool children display a gender identity and gender type behavior that reflects biological, cognitive, and social influences. Here, we will examine gender stereotypes as well as gender similarities and differences. To define gender, gender is a rule what society wants us to play as a girl or boy, like how to talk, walk, eat, drink, sleep, dress up, etc. And actually, gender means to the role of a woman and a man has to play to keep their society happy. 
but this kind of roles vary greatly between societies. Because different society has different culture, and culture changes time to time, that's why gender is highly fluid. Gender stereotypes. Recent research has found that gender stereotypes are to a great extent still present in today's world, in the lives of both children and adults. Gender stereotyping continues to change during middle and late childhood and adolescence. By the time children enter elementary school, they have considerable knowledge about which activities are linked with being male or female. Until about seven to eight years of age, gender stereotyping is extensive because young children don't recognize individual variations in masculinity and femininity. By five years of age, both boys and girls stereotypes both as powerful and in more negative terms such as mean, and girls in more positive terms such as nice. Across the elementary school years, children become more flexible in their gender attitudes. So, a gender stereotype is a generalized view or preconception about attributes or characteristics or the roles that are ought to be possessed by or performed by. Gender stereotypes in middle and late childhood is still present nowadays, but not in discriminative ways such as fights for feminism and outnumbering gender etc. It is present in such ways that both have different appearances and interests to things, and the fact that they are oriented or already have knowledge with what activities are being linked to male and female. So moving on to gender similarities and differences. What is the reality behind gender stereotypes? Let's examine some of the similarities and differences between the sexes. The differences are averages, not all females versus all males. Even when differences are reported, there is considerable overlap between the sexes, and the differences may be due primarily to biological factors, social cultural factors, or both. First, we will examine physical similarities and differences, and then we will turn to cognitive and social emotional similarities and differences. Let's start with physical development. Women have about twice the body fat of men, most of it concentrated around their breasts and hips. In males, fat is more likely to go to the abdomen. On average, males grow to be 10% taller than female. Female brains are approximately 10% smaller than male brains. In cognitive development, research has shown that in general, girls and women have slightly better verbal skills than boys and men, although in some verbal skill areas, the differences are substantial. Therefore. No gender differences in general intelligence have been revealed. And the last one is social-emotional development. Three areas of social-emotional development in which gender similarities and differences have been studied extensively are aggression, emotion, and pro-social behavior. One of the most consistent gender differences found is that boys are more physically aggressive than girls are. Correspondingly, children start to identify certain activities and abilities as being characteristically masculine or feminine. This new awareness may affect their willingness to engage in behaviors, not characteristic of their own gender, even if they previously used to enjoy those behaviors. For example, kids might tell you that boys are better at sports, mathematics, and mechanics, while girls are better at reading, art, music, and spelling. They might also report that assertiveness and competitiveness are masculine traits, while being affectionate or self-spoken are more feminine qualities. So gender in context. Gender stereotypes describe people in terms of personality traits such as aggressive or caring. However, the traits people display may vary with the situation. Thus, the nature and extent of gender differences may depend on the context. The stereotypes is that females are better than males at helping, but it it depends on the situation. Females are more likely than males to volunteer their time to help children with personal problems and to engage in caregiving behaviors. However, in situations which males feel a sense of competence and in circumstances that involve danger, males are more likely than females to help. Indeed, one study documented that males are more likely to help when the context is masculine in nature. The importance of considering gender in context is nowhere more apparent than when examining what is culturally prescribed behavior for females and males in different countries around the world. So basically, it states here that boys in context are more interested in doing or initiating things that are hardcore in nature, such as the context is in danger, or things that just involve showing off masculinity, while in female context, they are more in the soft side or things that involve emotions, care, and especially, fragility. So in this figure, you can see an image of a woman, a Chinese woman, who were working on a farm while carrying her baby on top. In China, females and males are usually socialized to behave, feel, and think differently. The old patriarchal traditions of male supremacy have not been completely uprooted. Chinese women still make considerably less money than Chinese men do. And in rural China, such as here in the Lijian village or Sichuan, male supremacy still governs many women's lives. So in this figure, it states that the Chinese woman basically does the same as what the Chinese men basically do. Thus, the Chinese women are compensated and credited unfairly. Gender supremacy is present in middle and late childhood. Contextually, 
Some group of women in most parts of the world fight for their right because they feel that woman stereotyping does not define their capabilities and power, same as what a man can do. In line with the gender context in middle and late childhood, youth's understanding of gender is quite rigid and stereotyped. As a result, younger adolescents will typically participate in more gender stereotype behaviors than do older adolescents. This means that girls will gravitate towards more girl activities and present an ultra-feminine appearance, while guys will lean towards more guy activities and present an uber-masculine appearance. There are a number of reasons for these gender stereotype behaviors. I believe I have mentioned that in the first slides. The increase in gender stereotype behaviors generally peaks during middle adolescence and then begins to subside. By late adolescence, youth's gender identity typically becomes more stable but without rigidity. At this point, you feel confident and secure enough to enjoy activities that interest them, regardless of whether or not these activities are traditionally associated with their gender. It becomes more fluid and universal from what they want to do, so eventually, it will come a time where gender fights for rights take place. In addition, we define ourselves on the things that interest us. We are the things that we love. If the things that we love are stereotypically for boys, it doesn't mean that we don't have to get it. We become more fluid on the things that interest us as the time goes by. So, it's completely okay that we don't put ourselves in one context of gender that society defines us to be. So I guess that's all we have for this topic, the emotional and personality development. This is Megan, Aaron, Dave, and I hope you guys learned something from it. Bye everyone! Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I will going to share with you the second and the third aspect of social-emotional development of middle and late childhood, which is families and peers. In this topic, we will focus on how parent-child interactions and peer relationships typically change in this particular stage of development. We all know that family is the basic unit of the society and that parents play an important role to a child's life. So some developmental changes in parent-child relationship during this stage includes the following. Number one is that parents will spend less time with children. At this particular stage, children will already be in school. So second is that parents support stimulate children's academic achievement. This is the important role of a parent as this will show the value they place in education as later on it will determine if their child do well in school. Third is that parents use less physical forms of punishment. So no more spanking, coercive holding. Instead, they will use deprivation of privileges, appeals to child's self-esteem, comments designed to increase child's sense of guilt, and statements that will make them responsible to their actions. And lastly, parents as managers. So mothers usually engage in managerial role in parenting compared to fathers. This means that mothers will establish routines for homework, chores, bedtime, and so on. They will effectively monitor a child's behavior. Next is step families. So this refers to the family where at least one parent has children that are not biologically or adaptive related to the other spouse or partner. So this usually involves children who are in elementary or high school. It is very prevalent in the U.S. or in European countries where in divorce is very common. So there are three types of stepfamily structure. So number one is stepfather. This refers to the mother having the custody of the children and then remarried and introduced a stepfather to the children. Second is a stepmother, where father had the custody of the children, remarried, and introduced a stepmother to the children. And the third type is the blended or complex stepfamily, where both parents bring children from previous marriages. So there's a longitudinal analysis of Hetherington in 2006, where he found out that children and adolescents who is in a simple stepfamily, referring to stepfather or stepmother only, for a number of years adjusted well compared to the children and adolescents in a conflict, non-divorced family and those who are in blended complex stepfamily. However, difficulty may occur because becoming part of a stepfamily is really complicated. 
to a normal adolescent concern such as identity, sexuality, and autonomy. So the second topic is about peers. So peers refers to a group of individual or people who are having the same age or grade level. So children usually at this stage stays in school, so they will tend to have a lot of friends of the same age or grade level. So the developmental changes within peers includes the percentage of time spent in social interaction increases, the size of peer group increases, the peer interaction is less closely supervised by adults, and lastly, same-sex peer groups increases also. Then we have sociometric status. This is a term that describes the extent to which children are liked or disliked by their peer groups. So this will be typically assessed by asking children to rate how much they like or dislike each of their classmates or asking them to name the children that they like the most or like the least. Developmentalists have distinguished five peer statuses. So number one, we have the popular children. This refers to the frequently nominated as best friend and are rarely disliked by their peers. Second is the average children. This receives an average number of both positive and negative nominations from their peers. Third is the neglected children. They are infrequently nominated as a best friend but are not disliked by their peers. Fourth is the rejected children. These are infrequently nominated as someone's best friend and are actively disliked by their peers. And lastly, the controversial children. They are frequently nominated both as someone's best friend and as being disliked. So in the presentation, we have the question there, why do rejected children have social problems? Jan Kowi provided three reasons why aggressive Peer rejected boys have problems in social relationships. Number one is that aggressive boys are more impulsive and have problems in sustaining attentions. So they are most likely to be disruptive of the ongoing activities in the classroom and in focused group play. Second is that they are emotionally reactive. So once they are aroused to anger, then they will be having a difficulty of calming down. And lastly is that they have fewer social skills in making friends and maintaining positive relationships with peers. And so we have social cognition. These are thoughts about social matters that is important for understanding peer relationship. So children at this stage should increasingly develop their understanding towards peer relationship as this will be important in interpretation of the encounter that they will have in their peer groups. So according to Kenneth Dodge, he argues that children go through six steps in processing information about the social world. So number one is to attend to social cues. Second is to attribute intent. Third is to generate goals. Fourth is to assess behavioral scripts from memory. Fifth is to make decisions. And lastly, to enact behavior. So we have bullying. So this refers to the verbal and physical behavior intended to disturb someone less powerful. So bullying could include belittling about religion or race, looks or speech, being hit, slapped, or pushed, subject of rumors, or sexual comments and gestures. So bullying will most likely result to depression, suicidal adjacent, and attempted suicide. So based on the presentation, we have here the figure or the graph showing the types of bullying often experienced in the U.S., so the percentages reflect the extent of which bullied students said that they had experienced a particular type of bullying. So in terms of gender, note that when they were bullied, boys were more likely to be hit, slapped, or pushed than girls were. 
Cyberbullying. So, it is a type of bullying that takes place over digital devices like cell phones, computers, and tablets. It can occur through SMS or text, through apps, or any forms of social media, forums, or gaming where people can view, participate, and share the content. A study was conducted involving a third to sixth graders revealed that engaging in cyber aggression is related to loneliness, lower self-esteem, fewer mutual friends, and lower peer popularity. There's also a meta-analysis conclusion that being the victim of cyberbullying is linked to stress and suicidal adjacent. And another study found out that it was more strongly associated with suicidal adjacent than traditional bullying. As it reveals that cyberbullying occurred twice as much as traditional bullying. And that those who are engaged in cyberbullying were likely also to engage in traditional bullying. Friendship is really an important aspect to a child's development. That's according to Bagwell and Bokoski in 2018. According also to Heidi Wills, a friend is someone who makes it easy to believe in yourself. As described by the slide, friends refer to more similar than dissimilar in terms of age, sex, race, and etc. And the study found out by Hartop that it also provides cognitive and emotional resources from childhood to old age and that it also fosters self-esteem and a sense of well-being. So we all know that friendship is an important aspect to a child's development. So Gottman and Parker come up with six functions of children's friendships. Number one is for companionship, meaning it provides children with a familiar partner and a playmate Someone who is willing to spend time with them and join in collaborative activities. Second is for stimulation. Friendship provides children with interesting information, excitement, and amusement. Third is for physical support. Friendship provides resources and assistance. Fourth is for ego support, meaning it provides them the expectation of support, encouragement, and feedback that helps children maintain an impression of themselves to be competent, attractive, and worthwhile individuals. Then we have social comparison. Friendship provides information about where the child stands vis-a-vis -vis others and whether the child is doing okay. And then the last function is for affection and intimacy, meaning it provides children with a warm, close, trusting relationship with another individual. So we have the term intimacy in friendships. So it is a characterized by self-disclosure and sharing of private thoughts. So having friends can really be an advantage in the developmental stage of a child. However, friendships are not all alike, meaning we all have different companies to keep, meaning the friends that we have. Developmental advantages only occur when a child's group of friends are socially skilled and supportive. So for example, a student with friends who are academically oriented, then most likely that group of friends will achieve success in school themselves. So that ends my report about the roles of families and peers in the development of middle and late childhood. Thank you for listening. Schools are a big part of a child's development. Schools is where a child creates new relationships and ad adopt new standards to judge themselves. By the time they graduate, they have spent 12,000 hours in a classroom and their feelings, behavior, and attitude have been defined by this small unit of everyday life. There are many controversies surrounding which teaching approach works best. This time, we are only going to focus on two, the constructivist approach and the direct instruction approach. The constructivist approach is a learner-centered educational approach that emphasizes the importance of individuals actively constructing their knowledge and understanding with guidance from the teacher. In this approach, a child is encouraged to learn for themselves with first-hand experience. The child is not tasked to memorize information, but instead encouraged to create their own understanding with a guidance from a teacher, which gives the child more developed critical thinking skills. Direct information approach, on the other hand, is the exact opposite. 
This is a teacher-centered approach where the teacher has complete control of what the child should learn and how they should learn it. This is usually paired with academic tasks that focus on information retention. With this approach, the student's learning time is maximized. Some experts believe that many effective teachers use a combination of these two approaches. No matter how good the teacher and the teaching approach is, some children still have barriers to learning. Most common of this is poverty. While the book uses data from America, the same thing applies to the Philippines. Schools in low-income areas have little to no instruments that could aid in teaching. Pair this with parents that maybe couldn't teach their children because they themselves can't read or write on the possible high crime rate of their environment results to more low-achievement test scores, lower graduation rates, and smaller percentages of students going to college. Another barrier a child might face is ethnicity. While you might not think about this in Philippines, but this actually happens. Students from native tribes all over the Philippines have a hard time merging with their classmates from big cities, not to mention the amount of exchange and foreign students the country has.